Hello, and welcome to our new podcast, The Problem with Men. This podcast was set up because it feels that for the past few decades, there's been great strides in the lifting up of other groups, and it sometimes feels like maybe men have been neglected. Times have changed, and sometimes it's difficult for us to know how to act, how to behave. We're constantly being challenged to do better, but we're also accused of not needing help because we've got male privilege. We're told we're toxic, but no one is telling us why and how to fix that. At the same time, there's almost a hostility towards men having problems. We're expected to man up, be strong and move on. So this podcast over the coming episodes will look at different issues and problems men face. Areas where we're disadvantaged, where we maybe don't know how to deal with things or where to get help. Subscribe to the podcast now to make sure you don't miss any of our future episodes. Over the next few months, we'll be exploring a diverse range of issues facing modern man. We're also keen to hear from you. What issues should we be covering? What is going on in your life that you feel isn't being talked about? What stories do you think need to be told? You can get in touch with us via our website at theproblemwithmen.co.uk. You're listening to The Problem With Men podcast. In this episode, we're going back to school. If you're a young boy entering the school system this year, you're likely to be behind your female peers from the outset. So what's going on? Are men just not as smart? Why are schools failing boys? Is there some kind of sexism at play? But more importantly, what are we doing to fix this? For decades, official statistics released by governments have recorded a gender gap in our schools. They show that at every measurable stage, boys are lagging behind. And the gap grows as pupils go through secondary school, meaning fewer and fewer boys are going on to further education and university. So why are schools getting an F when it comes to educating boys? One thing the education system is good at is tracking pupils' progress. My name is uh, Gijsbert Stoet. I work at the University of Essex as a professor of psychology. One of his research topics has been looking at the achievement of boys and girls in education. We know that generally boys fall behind, in, especially in language learning. Boys are just slower than girls to uh, learn words, and that is most likely entirely due to biological reasons. And then, you know, they go to secondary education, then it just gets worse. By the time children finish their really compulsory part of the, you know, UK educational track, then boys are considerably less likely to continue with education, considerably less likely to go to the A-levels, which you need in the UK typically to continue with university education. Mary Cannot Cook is the former head of UCAS, the organisation that administrates the application process for students who want to attend university in the UK. It was definitely when I was at UCAS, the University Admissions Service, when I was chief exec there, because the wonderful thing about UCAS is that it has a treasure trove of data. And I could see that women were about a third more likely to go to university than men. And I thought, that's you know, I wasn't expecting that at all. And I thought, well, I'll look a bit more closely at why that is. So, of course, looked at school attainment data, and there it was, plain as plain. You know, boys were actually falling behind girls from right from early years, all through primary and then in secondary as well. And by the time they got to sixth form, you actually had about 30,000 fewer young men doing A-levels than young women. And, you know, whatever you think about how many people should or shouldn't go to university, the university entry figures... They sort of spotlight, you know, it's a way of understanding all that kind of accumulated disadvantage that picks up for different groups. It might come as a surprise to some people that a gender gap exists in education. What's concerning is, this is nothing new, nor is it unique to the UK. For decades, researchers have known about the gender gap and watched as it's widened. The gender gap is growing. And this can be seen across the majority of Western nations. I mean, I, I often introduce myself by saying, you know, I'm Gary Wilson. I've been working around raising boys achievement since 1993. You'd have thought I'd have got it sorted by now. But, you know, the fact is, it's not on the agenda. It's not on the national agenda. I don't know if you've ever heard much at all, you know, from the government about this issue. Uh, I certainly haven't. 
Gary Wilson was a teacher for 27 years. For the past 14 years, he's worked as an educational consultant. For much of his career, he's been dedicated to improving boys' attainment at school. And sure, my work is very much kind of raising teachers' awareness of all the all the barriers to boys' achievement. And uh, it's not just one or two reasons why boys aren't doing so well. I've got it down to 28 reasons, but I'm still working on it. You know what I mean? One of the issues Gary has uncovered in his research is the peer pressure that exists in classrooms. Teachers Pat, Square, Nerd are all names I can recall from my time in school. And I'm sure there are newer and more imaginative names going around classrooms today. Regardless of the language, the message for some boys is clear. School just isn't cool. Uh, from my experience, virtually every single Year 6 class in the country has got a small group of boys who are trying to drag other boys off cliffs. I call them the peer police cadets. And if we don't deal with them and with peer pressure, by the time they get to Year 10, they start running high schools. You know, there are high schools all over the place run by... Groups of uh, Year 10 boys who are telling other boys whether it's okay to care, to share, to think, to dream, to dance, to sing, you name it, you know? Mark Roberts is an English teacher, director of research, and the author of two books about boys' education. He's another of the small voices working on addressing the education gender gap, and he agrees that peer pressure is a real concern. Let's talk about peer pressure and the way that for boys, particularly boys who want to be popular, There is a real expectation that as a boy in education, you shouldn't be too keen. You shouldn't be swatty. You shouldn't be putting your hand up to answer questions. You shouldn't be kind of doing extra work. You certainly shouldn't be doing things like homework and uh, revision. Uh, and, And then, you know, showing any kind of interest in writing and reading, again, is seen as things that that's are largely stereotypically not boy. Uh, related activities so that is something that that has a big influence and it's often there as as this kind of hidden dynamic within the room or sometimes it's actually more overt where you can pick up on the fact that that certain boys are really uh, embarrassed about working hard or try to do things on the sly for that reason so peer pressure is is definitely there um, and it's something that holds boys back the stereotypes we're projecting onto our children can have a profound effect And it's not just what we're actively saying, either. Children absorb from our behaviours as much as they do from our words. Reading is one key example. When was the last time you read a book to your son, grandson or nephew? Gary Wilson again. In terms of reading, um, girls tend to spend a lot of time reading fiction. Boys tend to dip into uh, works of non-fiction. But the critical thing there is dip into... It means they're not reading as closely and as carefully as they would be if they were reading uh, fiction. So that's an issue. It's also an issue that um, they may not be read to at home by an older male. So prior to coming to school, they may think that reading stories is a girly thing to do because they may only be read to by, you know, older older females, by mum or whatever. Um, And they may never see an older male around the house reading. This is acutely concerning because we know that language is one area in particular where boys really struggle. And yet we're not always being a positive role model when it comes to reading. And the importance of this cannot be understated. It doesn't matter if he can't read when he starts school. But what matters is that he's got a love of a story. And you may be shocked to hear that only 50% of our children up to the age of seven, are read to at home at all. And quite proportionally, are only read to by mums. Therefore, there is that issue that we need older male role models in the close and extended family, helping them, reading with them, reading to them, and not stopping just because they could read. Because readers become leaders. You know, it's a, it's a fundamental issue as far as boys are concerned in school, and keeping them engaged and motivated with their reading so that by the time they get to high school the situation that we have now you know hopefully improves and the situation i'm referring to is that 70 percent of boys in high schools do not read at all for pleasure you know it's it's quite a critical thing mark roberts agrees on the importance that reading can have on developing language skills and improving overall educational attainment the number one thing i keep talking about reading but i think that is the number one thing if you look at the 
students who are academic successful, male or female, they tend to be ones who, who read a lot, particularly at an early age. So I think that, that making reading a priority, reading to them, listening to them read, making sure that there's plenty of books in the house, making sure that there are things there that they're interested in reading, talking to them about what you're reading, modelling you know, the fact that you're reading yourself in front of them. Uh, and, and crucially, when it comes to things like birthdays uh, and Christmas, we tend to buy boys things that are not books. We tend to buy boys, you know, sports equipment or video games or whatever it is. And, and you know, try to make it uh, a priority that you'll buy them a book each time and that you'll, you'll make that a real um, expectation that they're going to read and not just do it that it's going to be something that, that we're going to give for girls. So I think that, that's the kind of thing that, that can have a, a massive, massive impact. You're listening to the Problem With Men podcast. One thing we always hear about boys in school is that if they just put their mind to it, they could do well. There is a stereotype that boys just can't behave themselves. Gilbert Stute. Oh, oh, also, what you just hear from parents is, of course, that, that boys, they show slightly different behaviour, and, you know, it's fair enough to call some of that behaviour instinctive. Rough-and-tumble play is an example of that, so rumbling around on the floor, it is, but it's a play fight, so they are not really harming each other, and that can be for some teach some teachers will know that and some teachers might not entirely be aware of that and i can also see you know if you have a class with 35 kids which is not unusual in uk primary schools oh well, it's difficult if you have to keep track of so many children and you see a couple of kids fighting then you know maybe you want to be you you want to be safe that nobody gets harmed and then you say okay kids stop it even though maybe it it was not a major problem but I mean, also, I mean, I think where where is really a problem for boys is you know listening to their teachers, you know, doing what the teachers say. I w- I would definitely say that girls are just more compliant. They are more likely to listen to the teacher. So the teacher says, "Do this, this, and this." You know, sit at your table and and read a book or whatever it is. I mean, I can remember from my own school days being sent out of class and spending whole lessons sat alone in the corridor school's version of solitary confinement. Things have apparently moved on, though, as another unlikely corridor kid, Mark Roberts, explains. I, I had similar experiences as well. People find it hard to believe when, when you know, I'm a, a teacher and, uh, and you know, academically successful and so on, but I, I wasn't happy at school and I misbehaved at school as well. Um, but I think things have moved on. The, the, the days where you used to just kind of chuck annoying kids out into the corridor, like, like I used to spend a lot of time uh, out there, it tends not to happen. And teachers, in my experience, are really keen to try to keep students in because they know that for students to do well, they're going to need to be in lessons. Uh, and sometimes behaviour is, is poor and is disruptive and, and students do need to be uh, removed from lessons either temporarily or in more extreme circumstances, they might be you know, excluded and permanently excluded. And that's regrettable, but I don't think schools do that uh, without a great deal of thought and reluctance. While schools might have a reluctance to exclude children from lessons, there is an uncomfortable fact that most of the pupils who are excluded are male. The Men and Boys Coalition is an informal network committed to taking action on the gender-specific issues that affect men and boys. The Coalition CEO, Dan Bell, suggests that not only are boys excluded far more than girls, but that any poor behaviour can also influence the way boys are graded for their academic work. So, I mean, boys tend to be excluded from schools about three times the rate of girls. So there's a suggestion that just boys' actual rebunctiousness can be seen as more of a problem than it is for girls, which leads to negative outcomes from their learning. I suppose what's most concerning, though, is there are suggestions that boys can be marked more severely, even if they do the same work. So um, I think around 2015, there was an OECD report on gender and education across more than 60 countries, um, which found that girls receive higher marks compared with boys of the same ability. And there's a suggestion that uh, behaviour in school can influence uh, grades, even if the actual academic work is of a similar level. Several studies from different countries give evidence that the perception of a child's behaviour affects what we believe they're able to achieve. 
So if a boy generally misbehaves, the perception becomes that he's probably not going to do well academically. This perception means that if two students produce the same quality of work, the student with the poorer behaviour will be graded lower. And it's often expected that boys will behave worse than girls. Mark Roberts again. Yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of research out there that, that suggests that when you look at boys who are academically struggling, they're seen by teachers as typical boys. Girls who are high flyers are seen as typical girls. Uh, whereas boys who do well academically are seen by teachers as, as being unusual, seen, are seen as kind of anomalies. And often what the research shows is that teachers, in theory, believe that boys should do just as well as uh, girls academically. But when they get into the classroom with boys and, and they encounter some of the anti-school attitudes that boys will show at times, uh, it can lead to this lowering of expectations where they start re- resorting to stereotypical ideas that boys won't be able to cope with certain um, texts or certain amounts of reading or writing or that they're, they're going to struggle at certain subjects. So those kind of things, a lot of the time, it, they are unconscious biases uh, and teachers aren't always aware of them. But I think that there's definitely a lot of research out there that, to suggest that that work that is of a similar standard um, by boys and girls can sometimes be uh, marked more harshly when it's boys. Uh, And also there's evidence that when boys and girls display the same kind of behaviour within schools, often boys are punished more harshly for it as well. So there's definitely an element there that that teachers are unwittingly um, seeing boys as being a bit more problematic and, and that reflects itself in boys' achievement as well. I'm not an educator, I'm not an academic, so I'm not sure I'm really qualified to comment on this. But, you know, anecdotally, when you hear what people say, I, I feel like there's almost a a self-fulfilling belief that boys are a bit more difficult, more unruly, less able to concentrate and and so on. So perhaps unwittingly, teachers do treat them differently um, in a way that doesn't encourage them to get you know, to do their best at school. In the past, explanations for the educational gender gap have suggested that maybe boys aren't as good at coursework, or maybe they struggle in exams. Mary Kernock Cook suggests this narrative has always been changed to fit the situation. But that, you know, that's a flip-flopping narrative as well, because I don't know if you remember, but a few, let's say, 20 years ago or something, um, certainly 15 years ago, GCSEs and A-levels um, had much more coursework in them. And there was a view that girl, that, you know, that this explained why girls were doing better because they were better at coursework and, and boys were better at the kind of last minute dash for exam marks at the end of the course. Um, but even when coursework was removed from, pretty much totally removed from GCSEs and A-levels, um, girls just went on still doing doing better than boys so um yeah i don't you know maybe the narrative just changes to to suit what uh, what's going on 2020 and 2021 were unusual years for a levels the qualifications you need to get into university due to the covid pandemic exams were replaced with teacher assessment mary analyzed the a level results data from 2021 you know the fact that teacher assessed grades you know, where teachers had the opportunity to, in effect, say what they thought each kid was, you know, what their potential was, if circumstances had been normal, whether that was an exam or not, they um, they seem to give higher marks overall to girls than boys. Yeah, I didn't make myself very popular for suggesting that in, in one blog I wrote. Um, I just feel, well, if it's not true, then please explain to me what's going on. Because on the face of it, it does look like bias. If there's something else going on, then we need to understand it because then, then we can try and fix, you know, the, the root cause. But just saying it's not bias and then not saying, well, why is there this unexplained difference doesn't, doesn't really cut it for me. There will always be discrepancies in attainment in schools. Some of them we're usually aware of. It's why parents move to a different street to get into the good school's catchment area. We know that on the whole, kids from poorer backgrounds do worse than kids from wealthier areas. These discrepancies exist, but they make sense. 
What the change to assessments during COVID have exposed cannot be easily explained away, though. The gender gap exists within the same areas, in the same schools, and by kids taught by the same teachers. After the first year of teacher grading, Ofqual, the government department responsible for regulating qualifications, did some research to understand the effect teacher assessment would have on grades. The report stated, With respect to teacher assessment, evidence of teacher bias in relation to gender is mixed, but a slight bias in favour of girls or against boys is a common finding. Later, the report adds, on gender, bias in favour of girls or against boys in teacher assessment results was more commonly found than no bias. If you're enjoying this podcast, support our work by leaving a rating or review on your favourite podcast app. Problem with Men podcast. While the situation looks bleak, it's fair to say that it's not all teachers. And teachers do, on the whole, have a challenging task educating our young people. And there is some hope in the form of individuals working at the educational coalface. Individuals like Mark Roberts. I've seen so many teachers who've been able to develop really nurturing relationships with boys where they've been able to make them feel wanted and make them feel as if they really care about them and their results and so on. Um, but I think that there is evidence certainly there that, that sometimes boys um, frustrate teachers and that teachers sometimes have this sense of wouldn't it be easier if we were just teaching girls uh, and, and that's a real shame and that's one thing that in my books and when I talk to to schools and teachers I really try to get across that feeling that that, um, that boys deep down really want to do well they really do want to succeed and they don't always have the um, ability in terms of communication to get that across and that our role as teachers is, is to try to find ways to, to get beyond that front beyond that facade and, and, and find ways to, to make them feel motivated and successful in the classroom. Gary Wilson also warns us that we should maybe look beyond the poor behaviour we sometimes see from boys and not be too quick to judge. Uh, well I refer to them as uh, I refer to it as laddish behaviour you know, and and it exists, you know, to various degrees uh, in various places. But a lot of laddish behaviour is actually a cry for help. As, as far as a lot of boys are concerned, it's far better than to be seen not to be bothered about winning than entering and not winning. You see what I mean? And very often they'll throw up a smoke screen. And I'll say to teachers, it might not always feel like a cry for help last in a Friday afternoon, but I promise you some of it is, you know, and, and clearly there's an issue with that. It is important, you know, that, that teachers understand the incredible impact they have on youngsters. I'll say to teachers, you know, there are young people in, in your class for whom you know nobody's eyes light up when they go home. And you know that if a child's loved, they come to school to learn. If they're not loved, they come to school to be loved as well. And it's so important that we are real people for the for these youngsters, that we bring our personalities to school, you know. Um, and that in that context, what we can do, hopefully, is get those boys to unclench their hearts. That's the most important thing I say to teachers today. Never mind levels in literacy or numeracy. What we need to do is we need to help support them encouraging them so that they can open up their hearts and talk. Because boys have a, a lot more difficulty in talking and being open. And, you know, we know that, don't we? You know, that's, that, that, that's, that's well understood. Um, and, you know, very often at home, um, boys will be, well, not just at home, but very often by their peers will be told, you know, put yourself together, you're a boy, what's the matter with you? You know, or man up, I hate it. I hate that man-up stuff, you know. And of course, fixing things in the classroom isn't going to work if there continues to be negative stereotypes about men in wider society. Terms like toxic masculinity and male privilege can not only influence teachers, but can also have a deep impact on young people. 
as Mark Roberts explains. I, I write in Boys Don't Try um, about how toxic masculinity is a term that I, I think is quite problematic. I can understand why it's used and I can understand why people think that it's a really useful metaphor for all of these kind of destructive behaviours. Um, but I worry that, that using that term means that boys will see themselves as toxic and they'll see something about being male as being inherently bad. And I don't want that to happen. I want them to be able to see that there are certain behaviours that, that men show in society and that boys show in schools that are not healthy, that are destructive to themselves and to people around them. And I, and I won't shy away from having those kind of conversations. But I don't like to talk about this idea of, of, of there being a crisis with masculinity and that, that there's something naturally toxic about being male. I really want them to feel... Uh, as if they can succeed, as if they can be really good people. And uh, over time, if we can one at a time work with boys to make them really decent moral people who care, then we can shift these wider perceptions of, of what it means to be male. Uh, and I don't think there's anything to stop you from being someone who enjoys being male, enjoys all the kinds of things that you, you might enjoy about being male, but at the same time, it's not afraid to have this kind of sensitive, hardworking type where, you know, where you sit down and you can quite happily read a novel uh, and, and not feel as if you're doing something that's that's not manly. So, so yeah, I, I do worry that it, that it kind of contributes to their perception of themselves. But I think that the biggest thing that contributes to their perception of themselves is whether they are successful in individual subjects. Uh, and that's the thing that we need to work on. And that's why I suppose... Teachers are the ones who have got the, the best opportunity to make these kind of changes because we're the ones who are there with them day in, day out in the classroom, shaping their views of themselves academically. Obviously, outside of school, it's going to be reliant on their parents and their peers and other kind of influential adults to be positive role models for them. But when it comes to academic stuff, we, we certainly lead the way within the classroom. As dedicated and as hard as individual teachers might work at addressing the gender gap in education, it's crucial that something more concrete is done. Because as Professor of Psychology Gilbert Stout explains, the consequences of things staying the same can be quite drastic. So we do make predictions, and all our predictions are actually really bad. So in terms of the gap between boys and girls, we predict that this gap, including in STEM, will only grow larger. And the prediction also is that that boys will fall behind more uh, in the future. So the outlook is 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 not very good. And what are the consequences of that? Well, there there are a number of consequences. So one is uh, in in terms of finances, of obviously educational outcomes and income are directly related to one another. You know, the better you do in school, the more likely you will have a good earning later on. So this is, this is a problem for young men uh, that, you know, that do not complete their secondary education or that maybe say, well, you know, university is not for me. Another consequence is potentially, and this is like a, so, sort of like more a psychological issue, but you know, if you're a young man and you want to be successful in life, you know, everybody wants to be successful in life, um, and maybe you want to find a, a, a partner. <laughs> well, there's, there's, and this is well documented actually. Um, if you are not well educated, you know, your chances on the sort of like romantic market are just not as good as when you're well educated you know, of the poorest, which are often men, you know, like people living, homeless people, men living on the street, you know, they, they have very little chance of finding a, uh, a romantic partner. This whole gap in, in university education will lead to more men and, and probably also women not finding the right partner. So some people have said that it might lead to higher levels of criminality just because, you know, people who are not well educated who not cannot find their way in society might just say well look the only way for me to be successful in life is maybe to to deal in drugs or to become part of a gang 
so I think that is probably still, you know, that that would still that would not obviously not apply to everybody, and um, it would be wrong to to imply that. But uh, it's certainly a risk. Gary Wilson again. If, if anybody quibbles about what, whether or not we should be doing any any of this stuff for boys in education. Because if our boys do become disaffected, if they do become disengaged, there's a well-worn path ready and waiting for them, and it's the last thing we need. You know, 90% of prisoners aged under 25 are male. You know, so the picture is pretty bleak, but we can make a difference. You know, I wouldn't still be doing this if I didn't feel that was, that was possible. Teachers like Gary and Mark have done so much research into the issues boys face at school and have both independently concluded some basic changes could really help to close the gender gap. Gary Wilson's latest book, Let's Hear It From The Boys, focused on asking boys for their views. The most powerful information, the most you know, hard-hitting stuff that, that I've come across in my, in my you know, teaching experience and, and, and as a writer and as a, as a consultant is the last book that I wrote, which is called Let's Hear It From The Boys. And, you know, really, that was my starting point. Um, I'm 70 this year. I have no plans of retiring. But it is interesting. <laughs> I don't want to just come to that particular book because, actually, that's where we should start because the boys are the experts. They're the ones that live it day by day by day. You know, and I'm not quoting, you know, my research. I'm quoting what the boys are saying to me on a daily basis. Boys are very clear about... What would help them? They're very clear that, you know, they want teachers to earn their respect and not just expect it. They're very clear that they like teachers who are friendly and fun, but also firm and fair because boys know they know where to stand. I mean, boys are very clear on, you know, the lessons that that they prefer, some kind of activity, you know. Uh, It's not too much to ask, is it, you know, to do experiments in in science and so on. Uh, But boys are the real experts. Mark Roberts has put his research into two books, Boys Don't Try Rethinking Masculinity in Schools, and The Boy Question, How to Teach Boys to Succeed in School. And I think that the the best way to make sure that boys succeed is to develop positive relationships with boys in the classroom. Uh, And in my books, I, I give lots of strategies that I've used as a teacher and that the research suggests are the best ways to be able to motivate boys. So we have to make sure, for example that we're not dealing with boys' poor behaviour in any way that's aggressive or confrontational or trying to kind of out-masculinise the boys. Uh, it, it's clear from, from all of the research that the most effective form of communication to get these positive relationships with boys is to have a really clear, direct um, but very non-threatening kind of communication. Uh, and, and I think that, that when teachers start shouting at boys, it really doesn't work and it, it's really destructive to their long-term relationships. So there are certainly things that teachers can do to make boys more motivated and feel happier within the classroom. So to change the, the kind of culture and the ethos of a school, if you've got lots of boys in that school who, who are kind of think that it's not cool to, to learn uh, you know, prefer to, to mess around in lessons and are not doing the homework and are not revising and so on. It's not going to be a quick fix overnight. So you, you might be looking at a few years to put those in place. And it really does need the full support of, of all of the senior leaders within that school. It's not going to be something that just one teacher in one classroom can can change the, the culture uh, in that way. So we'll need everyone to be, to be doing things and, and, and approaching things in the same way. But in terms of shifts into the way that boys think about their learning within a particular classroom. I think that there's certain things that you can do as a teacher, and and I've I've been working with with lots of schools around this. Just the language that we use and the way that we frame um, boys' failures and struggles and lack of confidence and so on, we can make quite rapid improvements in in my experience. And I've, I've seen teachers that have implemented some of my suggestions have have come back to me and said, you know, it really made a difference quite quickly. Uh, And and I think that you can get a group of boys within a classroom really seeing themselves in a much more positive way after a a bit of this kind of input. But yeah, on a bigger scale, it's going to take longer and these gaps aren't going to suddenly vanish overnight. But I, I think that if we 
implement these kind of things on, on a larger scale, then we would start to see the difference eventually. So there are clearly things that can be done to address the gender imbalance. And we clearly have people advocating for change. But why is the government so dismissive of the issue? Especially when voices from all sides are apparently calling for equality. Mary cannot cook. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I th- you know, I think I'm a pretty much a sort of unreconstructed feminist. I started work in the in a man's world in the late 70s. But you know what? I just I dislike the idea of men being written off because they're men just as much as I dislike the idea of women being written off because they're women. Um, I've just always thought that if we want gender equality, uh, we need men to be educated as well as women. You know, we need men who can, I don't know, intellectualize or, or instinctively get and advocate for equality. And, you know, we don't need to trample over their dreams to do this. So, yeah, I haven't made myself um, altogether popular sometimes, but I keep trying anyway. It's sometimes unpopular or unfashionable to support men and boys issues. Um, I think it's really telling that we have a women and equalities minister, you know, which I just think it's a contradiction in terms. Um, And it does seem to take a certain kind of courage to speak up for men and... I think there's a tendency to think that speaking up for men somehow does harm to women's causes. I, you know, I just I just don't believe that. And society as a whole. But I mean, clearly, this should be in the inbox of the Department of Education, just, you know, in the same way they're on the hook for addressing all other groups who underachieve. And, and it just um, I just do not understand why they won't why they won't tackle this. They just seem to have a real blind spot about it. Dan Bell from the Men and Boys Coalition. When we question why nothing is being done about this issue, quite regularly the response is to refer to the pay gap as um, to say that, well, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't really matter because boys will do OK anyway. Um, and what that implies is that it... Um, there's a kind of a deliberate neglect because of perceived um, injustice um, uh, that they benefit from later on in life. So that the idea that boys, you know, don't need to be their edu- their, the fact they're falling behind girls in the education system doesn't matter because they leapfrog um, ahead of women later on um, in the career market. I mean, but that's an inappropriate response on all sorts of different levels. I mean, for one, um, boys who are falling in education don't suddenly get professional jobs and leapfrog women in uh, in uh, in pay later on in life. They they fall out of school altogether. They become under or unemployed and can be swept up by all sorts of the, the, the really grave social issues of exclusion. It's known. It's it's uh, every year um, the uh, the disparity between boys and young young men's and young women's educational achievement is published at A levels and GCSEs. Um, there's a kind of a headlines about the widening gap, and every year, more or less, every stakeholder, who's, you know, with relevant um, expertise, the educational establishment, policymakers, government, more or less, shrug their shoulders and move on. <laughs> I mean, that that I mean, I, that's not an exaggeration. It's a scandalous, and I don't think that's too strong a word. There are lots of academics out there who've been writing about this, um, but they're not the kinds of approaches that governments are picking up on. Uh, because it's it's obviously not just gender as well that's the issue. We've got issues of, of pupils being more disadvantaged. So it's not necessarily all boys who are struggling. But it's just, it tends to be that boys from a, a working class background who are more disadvantaged tend to struggle. It tends to be boys from certain ethnic backgrounds as well. Um, so I don't think that the, the political will is there really to, to look at some of the fundamental basis of, of what's leading to this inequality within society at large because it would recognize that that things like um, you know the impact of school choice and league tables and all those kinds of things which governments have set up previously to try to improve standards overall actually in in some ways have, have led to this widening of of gaps and 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 it's not a level playing field and and they would need to admit the fact that all the efforts to have greater accountability of schools and, uh, and as I say, the league tables and so on, 
unfair funding, all these kinds of things, they'd have to admit that they their policies have been wrong when it comes to this. Uh, and I just don't see that there. Is it because they just, you know, it tends to be white working class boys and they don't particularly matter? Is that the reason why it's not on the agenda? I ask myself fairly constantly. Is it because people think, if we do things for boys, doesn't that mean the girls are going to suffer? And I call that sloppy thinking. Anything that we do that looks at the attitude, the behaviour and the performance of boys is bound to have a positive knocking effect for the girls. Because it can be boys sometimes that behave in ways that are detrimental to everybody's learning. Do you see what I'm saying? And... And, and all, see, all the strategies that I talk about and write about are those that hit all those buttons for boys without disadvantaging the girls. Finally, Gary Wilson has some advice for any child who feels that they might be negatively branded by their previous bad behaviour. Bottom line is we love teaching boys. We love the fact they can get so enthusiastic when we grab them at something that really interests them. We love their, the fact their, their openness, we love their, their honesty. You know, we love the sense of fun, the sense of humour, and we love the fact that every day is a new day for them. And sometimes I think, isn't it a shame it's not always the same the other way around? Because one of the things that, again, significant numbers of boys tell me is they feel they've got this reputation and they just can't shift it. And, you know, part of my advice to, to, to boys in that situation is, please, please, go to a teacher that you get on with uh, that, that you know that you, you can talk to honestly and say to them look could you help me you know I'm in year 10 now and I, I know I should have been working harder but I really I really want to make a difference to say that to an individual teacher as a 14 year old boy is very difficult but to go to a teacher that you trust and to feel comfortable with and say that who then might you know do some mentoring for with that boy and sort this out and that out it, it can be massively powerful, but we don't know about all that stuff un- unless we actually talk to them, you know. Uh, parents need to get him to open up, talk about his feelings. I mean, a very common way uh, that I recommend is when you're taking him somewhere in the car. Just you. You're here. He's there. You can't get out. Perfect prisoner. But it's perfect because it's side by side, you know, and those moments are very, very precious. And that's the most comfortable way for him to talk and to open up as well, side by side. I know that because I spent years <laughs> saying to boys who were in trouble as a teacher, just look at me when I'm talking to you, will you? <laughs> you know, he's not going to do that because, you know, he doesn't want to you know, exchange that eye contact. So parents, yeah, there are loads of things that they can do. But I think one of the things they need to, need to know is that there is an issue. It's, it's not at their school, it's not just their boy, it's not just the UK, it's all over the developed world. The really crushing thing about this is that when you look beyond the statistics, you have little boys. Little boys who might give up on school because there seems to be no point. Maybe some of them will, against the odds, succeed. But how many might not? And how many of the boys that don't succeed already start off with disadvantage, with poverty, with a lack of family support. Every year that this isn't addressed, schools across the world will spit out a group of boys who maybe no one has really believed in, who no one has taken the time or put in a bit of effort to show them that they are valuable, that they can succeed. As Gary Wilson points out, the path for a lot of these boys is already laid out. The justice system is waiting for them. Strangely, myself, Gary and Mark all seem to have come from similar backgrounds and had similar experiences at school. So we know that there is hope, and we know that people can overcome the challenges and difficulties. But life can be tough enough without facing challenges that should be resolved by policy and regulation. This has been the Problem With Men podcast. I'd like to thank the experts who have taken the time to talk to us for this episode. You can find their details on our website at theproblemwithmen.co.uk, along with some of the sources and further reading on the gender gap in education. Our next episode is about divorce. Does the legal system favour women? Do men find it harder to move on? Hit subscribe on your podcast player to make sure you don't miss it. And until next time, goodbye.
Problem with Men podcast is an Octopus Industries production. Produced and presented by Chris Dodd and produced by Sandra Kabasinguzi.